Okay, so if the kernel engine takes 2,000 joules of heat from the 500K reservoir, and discard some heat at 350K, what is the work done? What is the heat discarded? All right, so this is like a simplest uh, direct application of the relationship that we just learned from Carnot engine. From the Carnot engine, Q hot over Q cold equal to T hot over T cold. This is a straightforward relationship that's applied to Carnot cycle or Carnot engine. Okay, so Q hot, okay, once again, in your head, it seems like it's good to have this sort of the overall diagram in mind. I think this is the good one. I'll keep this in your head all the time about the heat engine. Yeah, you draw in some heat from the hot reservoir, dump out some of them at the cold reservoir. The difference will be the useful work. And once again, if you don't want to worry about the direction, just put an absolute in there. Okay, so that's a whole idea. So over here, the kernel takes 2,000 joules of heat. So that's what it is. So this means it's drawing in. They want to figure out what is the uh, heat discarded. So I can do the ratio simply by 2,000 over Q coal equal to, equal to Q, uh, T hot 500K over T coal 350K. All right, and that's it. I can say Q coal is just... 350 over 500 times 2,000. And that's it, done. Just the ratio. All right, and that is 1,400 joules. That's nice. All right, very good. You guys with me, yeah, so far? And then, of course, you wanna figure out the work. The work is just the difference between the heat that flow in, subtract the heat flow out. So it's going to be 2,000, subtract out the discarded heat, 1,400, and that's it. It's a 600 joule. Is it just me that doesn't see the screen? <laughs> well, it, screen is not on. Hello. It's still on, right? The screen is on. I can see the screen. <laughs> I think like, yeah, I can see it too. <laughs> All right, so maybe just refresh or something. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. And actually I can add the third question if you want. What is the efficiency? Ah, see, so now you can do very simply, the efficiency is just, now you can do many things you like. You can do the work over the Q hot if you want, right? Which is because you know everything now. The Q hot is uh, right here. Or you can do one minus T co over T hot. Or you can do one over Q co over Q hot. So everything works now because you know all of the information that required to calculate the efficiency. Okay, so that's make things I hope a little bit clearer in terms of what does it mean by applying the Carnot relationship over here. <clears throat> Very nice. Okay, so it's gonna be 600 over 2000. All right, and then you can just say it's 0. 0.3. All right, so this is a 30% efficiency engine. Very good. I think I get it right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not very confident in terms of the you know, addition and subtraction. So do you see the screen now, Daniel? Yes. Is it okay at this point? Do you have to really launch the software? I mean, maybe or something? Or maybe he's rebooting or something. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no response. So maybe he's out. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
All right, maybe just wait for him a little bit, maybe. Okay, all right, so any questions on this? I think this is good, quite good, all right. Okay, if this is good, you guys can look at the next questions. All right, this looks more complicated now. Things get a little bit more serious here. And I mean, if you look forward a bit, actually this is the, I would say the big two. This is the big two exercises that we're going to spend time working on this. And this is the, the it's like a good representative for anything that we have been doing so far. So it's take you to analyze a cycle in PV diagram. But now that cycle actually representing a heat engine. So this is the reason why when we were studying the first law of thermodynamics, we were looking at you know, some processes and then eventually toward the uh, later exercises, I'm trying to show you the cyclic, uh, the cyclic processes and all this stuff. So now I will make the connections right here is actually those cyclic process that you saw in the PV diagram can actually representing a heat engine. Okay, sounds good. All right, so now when you look at this PV diagram that has a cyclic process, it can actually representing some engine that's operating. And this is first example that sort of showing you this, like here. So a heat engine operates using this cycle shown. Here we go. Now the working substance is given to be two mole of helium gas, assuming ideal. And the information given right here is the maximum temperature. So it means the highest temperature in operating this engine is 270, uh, 327 Celsius. All right. And of course, you can turn this into Kelvin, definitely, by taking this, add it to 73 through it. Okay, and turns out to be 600 Kelvin. Very good. All right. Now the process BC is isothermal. So that's good. Every time that we see isothermal, it means it's on an isotherm. Okay. And you can imagine in your head all the time that in the PE diagram, there's always an isotherm in here. Okay. The pressure at A and at C is given to be 10 to the fifth. So let me mark on that, 10 to the fifth. Very good. And the pressure as B is given, that's nice, to be three times, three times 10 to the fifth. Very good. All right, that's it, that's the information. The question asks you, how much heat enters and leaves the gas each cycle? Here we go, that's the first question. All right, and once you know that, and once you know how to calculate the heat, the da, the da, you can now answer the part B. What about the work? What about the efficiency? And then of course, the final question would be, how would this engine compare to the Carnot engine, the best, highest efficient engine in the universe, something like this. So here you see the sort of the idea behind this whole thing is just the addition of the definition of the efficiency, right? but the rest you still have to deal with uh, how to calculate the heat flow anyway. Okay, all right. So, Daniel, you back here? You see the screen now? Yeah, I hope. Sort of. All right. Thank you. All right. Just waiting, trying to sort of wait out for you a bit. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Let's get going. Part A. How can you figure out the heat involved in this process? you do just like what you did with the previous exercises. So you break this into sections, of course, because you have A to B, B to C, C back to A, right? So now you will see that I'm going to do one more time, just like the previous exercises. Let's go for it. So I'm gonna start from A to B. Okay, let's do this one more time. When you see A to B, which one would you wanna attack first? W, the work, because it's a constant volume process, no expansion of gas, no contraction of gas, nothing. So the work done is zero. When the work done is zero, 
Q equal to delta U, right? Very nice. Okay. Or if you want, you can figure out delta U first, and that will be three half N R delta T. Yes, yes, yes. Very good, very good. All right. And because they already give you an information that the highest temperature at ten uh, that this engine is working on is 600K. You think which line will be 600K? Of course, you will say that it's going to be the upper isotherm here, isotherm here that is going to be 600K. So that means now you already know the temperature at point B and the temperature at point C must be 600K. Very good, very good. And from the things that we have learned before, can you figure out the temperature at point A? Well, Adan, that's no big deal because we already did this in the first couple of exercises. You just try to link between A to some other points that you know how it goes. You can go with A and B. If you want to compare between A and B, I would say B A V A over T A equal to P B V B over T B, right? <laughs> and then, because the volume does not change, the volume cancels out. So the ratio between the pressure and the temperature stays constant. And because the pressure at B is three times, the temperature must be three times as well. So you know right away the temperature at A is going to be 200 Kelvin. Nice. So we sort of apply equation of state right away. So that means now you know the temperature at all points, A, B, and C. That allows you to calculate the delta U from A to B. It's going to be 3 half, N is 2 because that's 2 moles. R, once again, I'll just leave R there. Don't want to plug in the number. Delta T will be T final, T at B, minus T initial, T at A. Very nice. Okay, and because A to B, you see that the temperature increases, you can expect that the delta U must be increases as well, positive change. So what you get over here is going to be 3R times temperature change from 200 to 600. So that's going to be 400. So the final numbers that you get from here is going to be 12,000 R. You guys okay with this? Very good. And as you can see, the sign is automatic. The Q is positive. So what does it mean? It means heat flow into the system. And now it's time for me to write this. Q A B. And now you start to see what does it mean by the arrow that point in, in what? into the enclosed area over here, right? Because in the heat engine, you always operate in cycle. So there will be an enclosed volume. I'm sorry, the enclosed area. And if you sort of remember, <laughs> it doesn't have to be remember, if you remember the previous, previous exercises, the enclosed area actually will give you the W eventually, eventually. All right, but that's, going to eventually reveal itself later, but you already know ahead of time that the enclosed volume is going to be the work done by this cycle. Very nice. Okay, so far so good. So you're done with A to B, is it fine? Yeah. All right, try again. We just keep repeating this. You go from B to C. Try B to C. What kind of process is this? is an isothermal process. Nice. Okay. So for this one, I'm just going to sort of leave the subscript. Should I write a subscript here? I mean, it's going to look dirty a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me write a subscript so you guys won't get confused. Here we go. All right. So let me put there. So over here is going to be delta U, B to C. Here we go. Let me put subscript there. Next. So done, delta U is gone because temperature does not change going from B to C. What else do you know? In isothermal process, W 
is going to be the area under the curve and it's going to be NRT log of V final, which is the V at C over V initial is going to be V at B. Cool. All right. We know everything pretty much. N is two. R is R, just leave it there. Don't want to deal with it yet. Temperature, nice, 600 Kelvin. And now I put log of the volume. Can you figure out the volume at C, guys? Well, no problem, Majan, because once again, go back to the equation of states. B and C are on the same temperature. So PB, VB over TB equal to PC, VC over TC. Yeah, and temperature are the same, so I can cross it out. So but what should be the volume then? Okay, so you look at the pressure. Because the pressure at C is one third of the pressure at B. So it means the volume at C is going to be three times. Okay, so that gives you the volume at C is going to be three times the volume at A. You guys with me? Okay, now, because the pressure at B is higher than pressure at C three times. So the volume has to compensate at C three times to make the product between pressure and volume constants. So that means log in here is going to, going to be log three. Very good. And it's positive automatically because volume at C is bigger than the volume at B. So it's automatically positive. And everyone knows gas expands, you get a positive work done by the gas. And that's it guys. This is 12,000 log three times R. And you guys know exactly this must be QBC as well. You guys with me? From the first law of thermodynamics because delta U is already gone. So when the delta U is gone, Q must be equal to W. Whatever W that you got, that must be the Q. And because Q is positive, it means heat flow into the system. Bam. Let me put the arrow inward. That is going to be heat from B to C flow into the system. I'm kind of like having fun here. <laughs> Not too bad, I hope. All right. Cool. All right. And now you guys can take me to the rest of this thing from C to A. All right. I'm going to squeeze them all in one page right here. <laughs> Even though I have more space here, but well, I'm going to stick with this. And because you guys seem to follow, yeah. All right, so I don't have to rewrite much here. Okay, so C back to A. Wow, this one, I think I need more space here because it's an isobaric process, guys. Isobaric process, yeah, constant pressure. So first of all, you should be able to get the W first because the W is going to be the area under the curve. Yes, yes, okay. So when this area under the curve of the isobaric process is going to be just a rectangular area. So all you need to do is just figure out the rectangle below the AC curve. Okay. And that, let me highlight that area here. I think it's frozen on me. Oh, no. Okay. Let me reboot that one. Ah, it's back, I hope. Okay, it's still with me. Okay, here we go. All right, so it's going to be area under this AC curve. Okay. Here we go. All right, that blue shaded area right there. Okay. So let's get things calculated there. So W from C to A is going to be 
the width times the height. Okay. The width times the height. So it's going to be P delta V. Yes. Okay. And that's going to be P V at final point, point A, minus P at the first point at the point C. But then you look at this one. Ajahn is, uh, I don't have the, pr um, I mean, I know the pressure, but I don't know the volume. Because we just know that the volume is three times between A and C, but we don't know the value of it. But that's okay. We manipulate equation of states all the time. So it's going to be PV at A is going to be NRT at A. You guys mean PV equals to NRT all the time. PV at C is going to be NRT at C. We know temperature, 600K at point C, and it's 200K at point A. So perfect. N is 2, R is R, TA minus TC is just negative 400K. So it's negative 800R. You guys with me? And as expected, the work done is negative because you are compressing the gas. The gas is actually get compressed from C back to A. Nice. Okay, you start seeing the process right here. What else do you know? Okay. Well, Ajahn, going from C to A, I think I know temperature change so I can figure out Delta U. So let's do that. Now I have to change to a new page now. Delta U from C to A is going to be 3 half NR delta T. That's for the U. And that will be 3 half, three half N equal to 2. R is R. T final is T at A. T initial is T at C. And that's going to be temperature change of negative 400. So it's going to be negative 12,000 R. Here we go. You guys with me, yeah? And as expected, because the internal energy has to be decreasing because you are coming from higher isotherm to a lower isotherm. You're jumping down. So when you're jumping down, of course, temperature will be reduced and the internal energy will be decreasing along with it. So it's negative change. Okay, and that's it. Once again, from first law of thermodynamics, delta U equal to Q minus W. So you can figure out that the Q from C to A is going to be just the sum between the internal energy change and the work done. Yeah, very nice. So all you need to do is just add that two together. Negative 1200R and the negative 800R. So total is negative 2000R. Cool. But for those of you that still remember vaguely about Ajahn, we studied this a little bit of the constant pressure process. I can jump right into the Q right away if you sort of, you know, sort of remember a bit. The Q from C to A can be calculated by doing NCP delta T. You guys with me? Kun kun mawa. Right? We have. Constant volume will be NC sub V delta T. Constant pressure will be NC sub P delta T. You can do that too. You can jump right into the heat right away if you want. But you remember vaguely that this is going to be 5 half NR delta T. And if you do that, you're going to get exactly the same numbers right here. Okay. But the good, and it's not a good thing, but I mean, the, the, the way that I just did over here is just going through each term, the W, the delta U, and then sum them up, you get the heat Q. But if you do the summation without 
calculating number, it will be exactly the same as five half in R delta T. Okay, I hope you see, I keep repeating myself in many ways, right? It's the same thing, but it's just you know, going around and around and around. That is something that's kind of like, I don't like about thermodynamics pretty much. In, in when earlier, when I, when I meet these topics right here, it's just like, what is going on? So many details, so many, you know, temperature, pressure, volume. <laughs> so many tiny stuff all right but what does it mean when you get to the heat from c to a you get a negative sign so it means the heat flowing out so let me redraw what we got from here from a to b you get the heat flow in yeah that's a q b a to b yes from b to c you also get the heat flow in so i draw this q from b to c but now from C to A, you get the heat flow out. So let me draw this arrow like this. Now you start seeing things that has a sort of some relationship with the heat engine now. Can you see that? All right, so let's answer the questions. How much heat enters and leaves the gas each cycle? So now you know all the details. You know which part of the cycle that the heat comes in which part of the cycle that heat leaves the system so the net heat that flow in this one is definitely is going to be just the sum of these okay so the net heat for each cycle so each cycle oh what i'm saying <laughs> cycle you're gonna get qa and qb flow in. So let me put absolute sign there. That's a heat flow in. And you just subtract out the heat flow out, which is QC sub A. You see the now the relationship right here. In reality, if you don't put the absolute sign, all you need to do is just sum all of those heat together. You get the final result. But because right now, I want you to imagine that this one is the heat engine. So there will, be, there will be a heat flow in, that's a Q hot. And the heat flow out, that's a Q cold, right? But now you know, what does a Q hot mean? That's a Q A, B, plus Q B C. That's the heat flow in. You guys with me now? Okay, and what does the heat Q cold means? That is the heat flowing out. That's it. So the net heat that's going around in this cycle will be, this is the net heat right here. Mm -hmm. However, if you jump back to the first slide that I introduced the heat engine, yeah. The heat engine is operating in cycle. So the delta U is gone. There's no change. You're coming back to the original point. So whatever the heat that you try to calculate is going to be the same as the work done by that engine. So going back here, you will say this is going to be the work done by the cycle as well. Because once you subtract the heat flow in and the heat flow out, that will be your W. That's right here. All right, I hope you see the whole <laughs> connections here. Okay. Why do we sort of like try to analyze, you know, some process in the PV diagram? And then, you know, once we have a cyclic process, it means something. That something is it can represent an operation of a heat engine. And within that cycle, you can now calculate the heat flow in, heat flow out, and then now you can link to how the engine operates. That will be the heat flow in, that's from the hot reservoir. The heat flow out, that will be the discarded heat to the cold reservoir. The difference can go nowhere except the work done by that engine. Okay. 
very cool. All right. And if you want to check the work, you can actually calculate the W from area under the curve. And you will see that eventually the W will be equal to the area enclosed by this cycle. Exactly. It has to be because that's what we're doing all along. Okay, so let's answer the questions. So each cycle, there will be a net heat flow in 1200R. Okay, let me do the color coded because so you get a better sort of relationship here. Along with the, where is that? Here. There you go. 12,000 log 3R. 12,000 log 3R. And then you subtract out that 2,000 R. Don't forget to put an absolute sign here already. So it just take just the number. Okay, all right. Yeah, the number might not be so nice, but it's not too bad. It's going to be Uh, okay, 1200 log three minus 800 R, something like this. Right. You can punch the calculator later. <laughs> All right, but in the exam, you know, personally, I don't mind. Leave it like this. I think this is fine. Okay. But I mean, it's kind of nice if you punch the calculator a little bit. Okay. All right. And now we can try answer the next questions. How much work does the engine do each cycle? It's right here. Same. <laughs> okay. So we are already answered the first part of the part B. Once we know the heat flow in, the heat flow out, there's difference will be just the work done. But then what we can add on top is what is the efficiency, guys? Of course, the efficiency is going to be the work divided by the Q hot. That is the key the amount of heat flow in from the hot reservoir. And this is the part that I think people make mistakes the most. You don't know which one to pick as a Q hot. I think that's the only things that sort of like maybe confuse you a bit. But now once we sort of draw the diagram, we draw everything so clearly like this, now you can sort of answer with confidence. It's going to be the W that we just got right here, divided by, here we go, QAB, and QBC. You guys with me? Because these are the two heats that flow into the gas or into the system or into the engine. So these, these two are the parts that you, will be considered as the Q hot because it's the drawn in heat, the heat that you draw in. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. I hope it works. Uh, I think it, it's going to work because, well, there's no more than this. Part C, compare this to the heat, uh, to the engine's efficiency with the maximum possible efficiency attainable with the hot and cold reservoirs by this cycle here. So I'm going to calculate this against efficiency of the Carnot engine. So this means if I want to find the upper limit of the efficiency possible that running between these two temperature, what are those two temperature? 600K and 200K. 600K and 200K. So these are the two, I mean, temperatures that this, site, uh, that this engine is operating between. So that means the best engine, which is the Carnot engine, can achieve the efficiency of one minus T co over T hot. And that will be one minus T co 200, T hot 600. And that will be one minus one third. And that will be two third. So that will be 66.67% efficiency. All right, and now, if you want, you can punch the number over here if you want to try it. 
just punch the calculator and see, you're not going to get the number bigger than 66.67. Impossible. Okay, it's going to be less. <laughs> I don't know how much less, but it's going to be less for sure. It has to be less. Less. <laughs> okay, it's kind of like you see the whole picture, I hope. All right, if that works, we'll be good. All right, we'll do one more. We'll do one more just to confirm your understanding of the whole thing. All right, we'll do one more. If you sound like, sort of like, well, kind of still vague a little bit or still not so sure what is going on, then you start to understand things now. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. But doesn't mean that for those of you that understand everything, you you coming in the wrong way, but it means that's very good already. All right. But you start to have some questions that mean you, you are onto something here. Okay. Try again. I have one more. One more. But it's going to be in the same kind of questions. Okay, come back here. Here we go. Okay. The question might be just as simple as, what is the thermal efficiency of the engine that operates by the end modes of monatomic ideal gas through the cycle shown? So instead of asking you a lot of stuff, it might just ask you, what is the efficiency of this engine? That's possible <laughs> because... To figure out this, you have to figure out the heat flow in and heat flow out automatically. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show, one, uh, show you one more time. One more time. Okay, guys, let's get going. Okay, so this is going to be the last exercise that that we're going to take, and the rest will be just briefly talk about the entropy for fun. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Okay. Give me one second here. I think you've muted yourself. He just said Pepnang and then he goes somewhere. Yes. <laughs> I'm on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? All right, here we go. All right, one more time. <laughs> Start from one to two. All right, we're going to attack the first thing first, which is work done is zero because it's a vertical line, no area under the curve, volume does not change, work done is zero. And the next thing is because it's a constant volume process, the heat, I mean, this just to remind you the formula that we built before is three half in R delta T, if you want. But if you don't want, well, this is it's just delta u. Because from the first law of thermodynamics, once the w is zero, the delta u is just heat. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, all right. And to do this, what I'm going to do is, is going to be three half n r t at two minus t at one. Okay, final minus initial. However, because for this one, we don't have the information about the temperature, but we have the information about this volume and pressure. So that's fine. We can use the equation of state to turn this into NRT. Okay, let me write three half NRT sub two is going to be P2V2. You guys with me? PV equal to NRT. NRT sub one is going to be P1V1. Nice. Cool. All right. And that's it. Now I can say three half is here. 
now I can substitute the pressure. P at two is two P naught. Volume at two is V naught. So it's going to be two P naught V naught. Subtract out the P at one and V at one. So it's going to be P naught V naught. And that's it. So the heat flow will be three half P naught V naught. There you go. See, that's done for the first section in the diagram. And as you can see, the heat flow is positive. Bam. Q12. Heat flow in. Yeah, it's kind of fun, yeah? <laughs> I don't know if it's fun or not. Okay, try again. Two to three. All right, it's an isobaric process. So like, oh, Ajahn, that's not too bad. W is going to be area under the curve, okay? Which from two to three is going to be the rectangle area beneath the two, three curve. So actually I can highlight that. Okay, let me do the color coded here. Let's do green, two, three. So it's all the way down here. Very good. There you go. <clears throat> okay, that is going to be P at two delta V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just the rectangle area. And because it's a delta V, so it's going to be V at three minus V at two. The volume, final volume is at three. The initial volume is at two. Very good. And now I can substitute pressure at point two or pressure at point three is two P naught, two P naught. The volume at three is the, and the volume at through two, it's just two V naught minus V naught. Okay. Cool. So it's gonna be two P naught V naught. That's for the work done, area under the curve. What else do we know? Delta U, we can calculate delta U. And it's going to be three half N R delta T. Yes, yes. That's a formula for the internal energy. And it's going to be three half N R T final minus T initial. It's going to be T at three minus T at two. But we don't have the information about temperature. That's okay because we can use PV equal to NRT. So it's gonna be P at three, V at three, minus P at two, V at two. Okay, and that's going to be three half. Okay, and I just read out P at three is two P naught, two V naught. Subtract out P at two, two P naught, V at two is V naught. So it's going to be four minus two, that's two, two, two cancel. So it's going to be three P naught, V naught right there. Not bad, not bad. It's doable. Okay. And at the end, the heat from the first law of thermodynamics. So let me write it again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> Q equal to delta U plus W. So heat from two to three is going to be delta U, three P naught, V naught, okay? Plus work done, two P naught, V naught. So the answer is five P naught, V naught. Very nice. Okay, and for those of you that are Atan, you can actually do NC sub P delta T as well. Let me do this. Heat flow from two to three will be NC sub P delta T because it's a constant pressure process. 
and it's going to be five half n r delta t, correct? And it's going to be five half, of course, n r t is equal to p v, so it's going to be p three v three minus p two v two. Very good. Okay, and p three v three minus p two v two is already done that here. I mean, in terms of the, the value of it. So it's going to be five over two times two P naught V naught. And you're gonna get the same answer, of course. Same. It's just a matter of if you wanna jump right into the heat calculation, you can do the C N C sub P delta T right away. Five half N R delta T. You get the heat right away. But this one, once again, I want to show you back and forth, back and forth. I can just going on with the work done first, followed by the change in the internal energy from the first law of thermodynamics. The sum of these two is the heat flow. You're going to get the same equation because that's how we derived this NC sub P delta T. Okay, cool. I hope. And what you got from here is a positive heat. So it means the heat is actually flowing. In, oops, sorry, let's use the green flow in to the system q23 okay all right and it seems like you're going to be able to do this for three four and four one right three to four four to one but wait a second from the look of these questions actually they're asking you to figure out the efficiency well hey Dan, i know from three to four, you think which direction that the heat should go? You think in or out? What do you think? Because one to two is vertical line upward, but three to four is vertical line downward. So the process should be opposite. So if you calculate from three to four, the heat from three to four must be flowing out. With the same reasoning, because two to three, there's a heat into the system. But four to one is a reverse process. So it reverse means reverse in direction. So from four to one, instead of drawing in the heat, the heat will actually get thrown out. Okay, you know that this is going to be the full cycle and the heat that's related will gonna look like this. Okay, here we go. Here's the good chart over here. We can actually answer the questions already you guys follow me here because the question right here they want to figure out the efficiency of this cycle right and the efficiency is what is w over q hot you guys with me yeah 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 so instead of taking you through this whole calculation for the section three to four and four to one I can actually answer the question now. Can you see how? Here we go. What is a W, guys? <laughs> what is a W? Perfect. It's going to be the area enclosed by the cycle. With me, guys, we have done this maybe a, a few times already. For you have uh, when time every time you have a full cyclic cycle, I mean cyclic process like this, the enclosed area is going to be the work done by the engine or by the cycle. So that means the W, the work done, is going to be just the width times the height, and that's going to be P naught V naught. You guys with me? Yes. And what do we have to divide this by? Q hot is what. Well, Ajahn, I got it. Q hot is the heat flow into the engine. And it's going to be Q12 and the Q23. Sum them up, done. And just add these two together, done. Okay. And that leads you to P naught, V naught. That's for the work. Subtract so out to the sum of the two that we just got right here. And right there, so it's going to be 3 half plus 5 P naught, V naught, see? 
I just pull a common factor P0, V0 out. And of course, efficiency has no unit. It's just a number. That's what the number they're going to get. I can flip around things a bit. So it's the 13, 2 on the top. That's oh, 13, sorry. Something like this. <laughs> Actually, you can punch the calculator if you don't want to do fractional number and all this stuff. Okay, so it's going to be 2 over 13. That's the efficiency. You can multiply by 100, you get a percentage. But isn't that cool? In the sense that that's how you determine the efficiency of a cycle. But it's all rely on the first law of thermodynamics that you have already built in the past week. Nice. Okay, guys. I think, I mean, you probably have to do a little bit of exercises to get used to this thing. But I would say the business of anal anal uh, sort of analysis of maybe thermodynamical processes or heat engine or everything is only rely on these three parameters or three quantities here. Heat, work, change in the internal energy. Only these three nothing else okay but now we throw in efficiency and Carnot engine which is the upper limit of attainable i mean the best efficiency attainable to any engine in the universe all right cool any questions all right so at least you guys can relax now <laughs> just relax a bit because in terms of the question in the exam we'll pr pretty much stop right here okay and the rest of this one, we'll just give you like a cool down <laughs> before we meet again on Thursday. So here we go. All right. So let me introduce a little bit of entropy. All right. For those of you that haven't watched Tenet, then might have some clue. Actually, it's not related. I mean, it's related, but it might not help because I still don't understand anything about that movie yet. All right. <laughs> okay. So the entropy, I think maybe, well, I cannot make any sort of good connections with the entropy very easily because this is the subject that is deep in, in well, in terms of definition, in terms of the connections, in terms of the detail. But anyway, the words that you probably have heard so much about entropy is disorderness somehow. But this is a bad thing. The bad thing is usually disorders is something that you cannot quantify it. <laughs> you don't know how to quantify this orderness. It's like, you know, your table looks messy. What would be the scale of your messiness and stuff like that? So this is the bad stuff. So in general, the disorderness, it's just something that you feel. The feeling that things get disordered. Okay. However, there is a better word now. Actually, it's information. And then for those of you that are doing these uh, computer science or computer engineering, you're going to see a lot more of this in your life. And especially when you do well, like quantum computations and all this stuff in the future that's coming in. When you say more disorders, it turns out it means that system actually contain more information. All right, more information. So I'm just going to use the word disorder just to represent something related to entropy. But then the final exercise, I mean, sort of examples, I'm going to relate to the information very briefly. And this is what it is. We can start looking at the disorders of the system by start from simple PV equal to NRT. Okay, so PV equal to NRT, that's something that we already okay with. And just to make things a little bit simple, I'm going to look at the isothermal process. Okay, so what I'm going to do over here is we say that the change okay let's see work that the system can do can be calculated by pdv but using the equation of state p equal to nrt over v that's no big deal but the thing that i want to sort of focus on is this ratio right here the increase in the volume with respect to the original volume is a fractional change of the volume actually this one implies a bit of this orderness of the system why is that so? So think of it this way. If you think of this room is like a, a playground, okay, so 
molecules like a, like children like playing in the playground, something like that. Wow, 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 go crazy. But then think about is if this room expands, so the volume increases, so there are more rooms for these kids to just running around, yeah, because the volume increases. So that means the molecule can travel to further volume. So there are more space for you to have to consider, analyze all this stuff. So that implies a little bit of the increase of the disorderness of the system. Or you can think of it as like, okay, there are more configuration that's at sort of this volume that increases at on top of the original one. Because now you have to know, hey, well, the gas can go there too with some velocity there, with the direction there. So there are more stuff. Yes, yeah, stuff means information. Yes, yeah, pretty much. So there are more stuff that increases along with the increase in volume. So actually this ratio right here implies a little bit of that increase of the disorderness. And using this, so I just turn NRT to the left-hand side, okay, over here. So I can say that the dV over V is just the heat involved in this process divided by NR and the T right here. And it turns out this pair right there is a quantity that is independent on path. Nice. So this one is like energy. Right? The energy, we don't care about the path. It's path independent. So same thing over here. So that's why they define this one as the change of the entropy. And actually, they decided to use this word to rhyme with the energy, actually. So there's an energy and there is an entropy, something like that. Okay, so that's what this thing is, sort of, well, we define it through thermodynamics, sort of relationship right here. And what's so good about this one or what's so complex about this one? We already learned that the heat is path dependent. Well, Adan, this is path dependent. But then it turns out once you divide it by the temperature is no more path dependent. That's so cool. But then the problem is, well, Adan, how can we know about this heat? You have to define it somehow. I mean, define in the sense that you have to figure out the process and then you calculate the heat flow, just like what we have been doing in the example. So that's why to make things calculate-able, <laughs> I mean, you can calculate the amount of heat here. It actually is going to be the heat that you can get from reversible process only. Otherwise, then, well, you don't know what's going on. You need the heat involved in the change that comes from the reversible process only. But that's make it nice. When you think of reversible, it means you can represent that change under PV diagram, think of it that way. If you can draw a curve, that curve is reversible because you can pick the directions. All right, so overall, all in all, let's say, this is the definition of the entropy. It's just a ratio between heat over temperature. And it's path independent. The nice thing is about path independent is you don't care about the path. Pick a point, pick another point, the entropy change stays the same no matter which path you take. And another nice thing is if you come in cyclic process, that change will go to zero, just like internal energy, right? When you come back to the original position, there's nothing changed. Okay, okay. all right. So just take my word for it. <laughs> there's, well, there's nothing deeper at this point. Okay, it's just the ratio between the heat from the revers reversible process over temperature you get the entropy change now come back to this and this is going to be the last time that you're going to see this free expansion example we already discussed about this one is a, an irreversible process the gas starting out at the bottom half of the container the membrane breaks the gas fill up the whole tank the volume increase you can think of it like twice as big so the volume is twice as big However, this one, Q is zero, W is zero, oops, sorry, W is zero, delta U is zero. So the first law of thermodynamics doesn't really give you anything anymore. It just says that these two systems, these two configurations has the same energy. However, everyone knows that it's going from left to right only, not right to left. There must be something changes. Something must be changed in here. 
but the energy is useless now. Energy doesn't really do any good. And that's what we're going to try to do here. We're going to calculate the entropy change in this process. Here we go. All right. First question. All right. Almost done. Stay with me. Five more minutes. <laughs> All right. Here we go. P V. Let's say the gas at the initial point has a volume V. And let's say it has some pressure. So this is point number one. That's number one. That's number one. Then it expands to twice as big. So that's 2V. The pressure must drop in half, right? Okay, so, okay, just to make things a little bit cleaner. Okay, let me draw this one a little bit higher. Here we go. That's point number one right there. So that's number one. So at point number two, the volume increased twice as big. So the pressure must drop in half. So it's going to be P over two. That's point number two. My question is, going from configuration one to two, do you think what kind of line or what kind of curve in the PV diagram, this process can be used to represent this process? What do you think? What kind of curve can represent this free expansion process? บอกอาจารย์ช่วยเฉลยเลยครับจะได้รีบพักผ่อนไอโซเทอร์ very good so this mean free expansion can be isotherm because the temperature does not change right so that means I can draw an isothermal line here okay however do you think is really isothermal expansion like this the answer is I have no clue When I say I have no clue, what does it mean? You think seriously. Just right the, at the moment of the membrane that's just broken, the gas start to fill out the whole volume. The pressure right here is kind of like small at the black dot right there because I mean the gas, all of the gas molecules haven't reached that black dot point yet. So the pressure at that point is kind of like I have no idea. It's kind of low. <laughs> okay. So it means it takes a little bit of time before the pressure will get sort of uniformly distributed within the container. And during that time, this free expansion will go crazy. I mean, I don't know how to define the pressure in this system. So actually, in the meantime, it's hard for me to say it's isothermal expansion all along from one to two. It's kind of like blur. It's sort of like undefined. I'm not so sure. Okay, you kind of get my idea here. So that's why I sort of like text the PV diagram curves to be something that representing a re an reversible process because this one is irreversible process. So that's why I say I cannot draw any curve to represent a free expansion process. You guys with me? Okay, okay. So that's why I cannot draw. A specific line in PV diagram, but your friend is good in the sense that, hey, Ajahn, they are lying on an isotherm. Very cool. The first point and the final points are on the same isotherm because they're sharing the same temperature. At least we know they are connected. Possible to connect them through isothermal line, but this actual process does not. Use the isothermal line to represent the expansion. You see what my point is, right? Okay, the expansion thing cannot be represented using PV diagram, but these two initial points, the final points, are on the same isothermal line. So I'm gonna use that line to do what? I'm gonna calculate the heat flow. That is a reversible heat because. I know a curve in the PV diagram, and that curve representing a reversible process. You see my point here. Yeah? So I'm going to use the property of the entropy that it doesn't care. I don't need to know the path. I can take any path going from A to B. I can go like this. I can go like that. I can go whatever, and then I try to calculate the entropy change 
they're going to give me the same numbers. So why go through all the trouble, pick the line that go crazy like this? I'm going to pick isothermal line. Okay, because isothermal curve connects point A and point B. And everyone knows how to calculate the isothermal process by starting from delta U equal to zero. So the heat equal to the work and the work is NRT log V final over V initial. Yes, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So let me write it there. Okay, this one I write it in terms of the differential, but actually what I can do is I can say the W is NRT log V final over V initial, and that is going to be NRT log two because the volume at the end is twice as big, okay? And then the entropy will be what? I just take this, which is the same as the heat, divided by temperature. Here we go. So the delta S, okay, is just the heat over temperature. Okay, let me jump out over here. Because the temperature is constant, I can pull it out. I can do anywhere with the temperature. So the temperature is actually going to cancel with the temperature from the NRT log two. So I'm going to do, I mean, I mean, well, I want to sort of like, don't want to deal with the integral and all this stuff. So I'm going to do it below here. So it's going to be one over T NRT log two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just make it a little bit simpler. Okay. And the T cancel. That's it. Bam, bam. I get the change of the entropy to be in R log two. See, no change in energy. First law of thermodynamics does not distinguish these two configurations, but the entropy increases. And that's it. The second law of thermodynamics say, okay, Say what? <laughs> the change in entropy of the universe must be greater than, oops, sorry, greater than zero for, here we go, irreversible process. And if you are dealing with the reversible, then it will be equal to zero. So it means no change. Here, you calculate the entropy change and is positive. And because this system doesn't have anything else, it's just the isolated system in the universe, this is it. So this is an irreversible process, which agree with everyone's sort of like understanding like, okay, this process is irreversible. All right, is that cool? <laughs> I don't know if it's cool or not. But what I'm saying is, because I already commented that this world is filled with irreversible processes. So it's mean actually entropy around us right now is increasing all the time. And that's why we get the sense of directions of things. Hot water cool down to room temperature. That's the direction it goes. That is increase in entropy. We are getting older, okay, starting from like, of course, one cell split into two cells, split into three cells, on and on, right? Well, not split into three cells, so like two, four, eight, 16, on and on. So as you can see, the disorderness, right, used vaguely, is getting increased, but now more in terms of the entropy, that's what it means. When you get more complicated in your system, the entropy is increasing. So when you are getting older, it means your entropy is increasing. You're getting old cell is dying, something like that. Entropy is changing that way. And that is an irreversible process. You cannot get back. And final remark is here, guys. Number two, this is for those computer engineering and computer science people. This is a two, it's a one bit system because you can think of this one is like a zero and one <laughs> that way. The gas filled and gas not filled. Yes or no, one or two, zero and one digital. So this is actually is two to the one. So it's a one bit system. So that's why you can think of this free expansion to represent like an information 
of yes and no, zero and one. And that's why I say actually the information is the something that we quantify. You can quanti quantify the information. And this is the idea. Number two right here is the amount of information that this gas system is sort of, you know, can carry with this system. Okay, I hope, okay, don't worry too much about detailed calculation over here. The reason I want to just jump right into the result from the isothermal process and then divide it by temperature right away because I don't want you guys to think about calculus too much for this exercise or I mean this example right here. Okay, sounds good. All right, so that's what it is. And if you guys watch tenets, that's the idea of the thing is our lives seem to go in one direction. Yeah, because entropy is increasing. So there is a sense of time and the entropy change. It seems like time go in the same direction as the entropy changes. So in the tenets, they try to get you to reverse that. <laughs> you get to the world that the ent entropy is actually decreasing. So that's why everything looks like you sort of go backward in time, something like that. But, well, that's the complicated issue that is time and entropy are actually the same thing or not. So it's, it's, it's a debatable subject. So that's kind of fun. Okay, guys. So that's it for today's lecture. Thanks for sticking with me for... Well, I hope it's not too heavy. It's more like a, at a workshop doing exercises.